Thank you. Um, and I wanted to start by acknowledging a very long list of co-authors, including a number of people who've provided data for this talk and also funding from NASA and the University of Wollongong. So Paul just provided some really fantastic background for this talk and much more than I can do in my one minute spiel. Um, but for anyone who just walked into the room, isoprene is the dominant non-methane volatile organic compound both globally and also in the southeast US. And it has a short lifetime in the atmosphere to oxidation by OH to form these peroxy radicals. And the fate of these peroxy radicals really depends on the chemical environment in which they're formed. And in the southeast US, as Paul's been talking about, there's plenty of NOx around for them to react with NO to take up a, a molecule of NOx and form isoprene nitrates. And this has big impacts on the atmospheric chemistry. The first generation isoprene nitrates, as we've been hearing, can be further oxidized to form a suite of second generation products. And it's really the fate of those that impact the NOx budget. So they can photolyze to recycle the NOx. They can deposit to remove the NOx from the atmosphere. They can also be taken up into the aerosol phase. And that has impacts on not only the NOx budget, but also on the organic aerosol and organic nitrate aerosol budget. So the goal of this work is really to constrain this whole process from top to bottom, from the emission of isoprene down through to the impacts on the NOx and aerosol budgets. And Seekers provides a really, really lovely data set to do that. Um, in addition to measuring a huge suite of species, including all the species that are listed in red here by the groups that are listed at the bottom, Seekers covered a broad range of conditions in the southeast US. The flight tracks are shown in black on that map, which is a map of simulated isoprene nitrate concentrations. So it's a really lovely data set for this problem. And to interpret this Seekers data set, we're using a new high resolution version of the GS Chem chemical transport model. This version is the highest resolution that we've used. We're running it at a quarter degree by 5 16 degree horizontal resolution over the entire North American domain. And that's nested within a coarse resolution global model. And we've updated the standard isoprene chemistry to take into account a lot of the new state of the science updates that have come out over the past couple of years for isoprene oxidation. And uh, we're using biogenic emissions from the newest version of Megan, Megan 2.1. And we've scaled the isoprene emissions to match the satellite formaldehyde data. Um, the isoprene emissions from the whole Seekers period are shown in the plot on the right there. And the outer box shows the entire North American domain. The inner orange box is the southeast region, and everything else I'm going to show is aggregate statistics over that southeast region. So we can get a test on how well we're doing for the isoprene emissions themselves by looking at isoprene and the standard oxidation products from aldehyde and MBK methacrylene. These plots show the median vertical profiles from all of the seekers' flights over the southeast US, from the observations in black, and from the model in red. And if you look at the magnitudes of the observations and model in surface air, you see that we do a pretty good job of getting the surface concentrations down at the bottom, um, which reflects the emissions. And the correlation between the observations and the model are quite high, which reflects a good representation of the sp spatial variability of the uh, emissions. We can also take a look at how we're doing with the chemistry. And to do that, we can use some of the unique tracers of the different oxidation pathways for isoprene. And these are all species that were measured by the Wenberg group. Um, so isoprene nitrates on the left, which reflect the oxidation by NO, um, peroxides in the middle, which reflect the HO2 pathway, and aldehydes on the right, which reflect the uh, peroxy radical isomerization pathway. Again, we do a reasonable job at representing the observations in the model, although there are some surface underestimates, and I'll talk about those for isoprene nitrates in particular in a minute. Um, I also want to point out that the correlations in surface air are really quite high, and that means that we have reasonable confidence in the model's ability to partition the fate of the peroxy radical between these two different pathways, especially for the two on the left, which are the dominant pathways uh, for this radical. So given that, we can use the model to get a sense of the conditions that were sampled during the Seekers campaign. And what I'm showing here are results from the model. These are at the high resolution, but sampled over the Seekers flight tracks. And this shows the percent of these isoprene peroxy radicals that are reacting with NO versus any other fate for the radicals. 
So areas shown in blue, like the Ozarks, are what we typically call low NOx. Uh, these are regions where most of the radicals are reacting with HO2 or isomerization. Areas in red, like this area nearby, are what we typically call high NOx, and most of the reaction with, is with NO. And the pie chart on the right shows the simulated campaign average, again, from the model for the fates of these proxy radicals. Um, so as we'd expect for the southeast US, there's plenty of NOx, and the dominant fate for these radicals is via reaction with NO. The question is, what is the impact of that on the NOx budget itself? Just what Paul was just talking about. So to start to answer that, we've been taking a look at some of the alkyl nitrate measurements. This is the sum of the total alkyl nitrates measured by Ron Cohen's group, and it's plotted against the formaldehyde um, from Tom Hanisco's measurement. Again, these are all in surface error, and the observations are in black, and the model is in red. And the relationship between these two species really reflects the uh, yields of these products coming out of the isoprene oxidation pathways. Um, in both the observations and the model, we see a pretty strong relationship, as has been observed previously. And the slope of the relationship is, is consistent between the model and the observations. It's consistent if we only sample the observations in low NOx or in high NOx regions, as diagnosed by the model. It's also very consistent with the relationship that was observed about a decade earlier during the 2004 ICART campaign. So this is a pretty robust statistic. And the robustness of that really speaks to a common source for these species meaning that we understand most of the formaldehyde, at least on short timescales, is coming out of this isoprene oxidation pathway. From that, we can pretty much infer that most of the alkyl nitrates that we were sampling over this region during seekers were also coming from isoprene oxidation. We can also get more insight by looking at some of the individual isoprene nitrate species. And um, just to reiterate from what was said earlier, the top figure here just is a reminder of the isoprene oxidation pathway um, via this NO reaction. So isoprene reacts with OH to form a peroxy radical, which reacts with NO to form this first generation isoprene nitrate that I'm showing in orange. And that can react to form a suite of second generation products that will be in various different colors. Uh, on the bottom here, on the left are the observations of total alkyl nitrates from the Cohen group. And on the right, the total alkyl nitrates from Geoschem. And in the colored wedges, I um, have put in the individual alkyl nitrate species that we have in the observations on the model. So this first wedge is the, the first generation isoprene nitrates. Again, like I said before, you can see that there's a bit of a surface underestimate in GeoSchem. And interestingly, we've taken a quick look at Paul Shepson's measurements from SOAS of these first generation species. We only have 10 day comparisons so far, but we don't see any bias there. So it's not entirely clear where this is coming from, but it's something we're, that we're still looking into. In any case, the first generation species really don't um, represent a big piece of this total alkyl nitrates pie. So we can add in some of the second generation species. And what I've got now are all of the things that are both individually measured by the Wember group and also explicitly modeled in GSChem. And there are some compensating biases in the model that we need to understand. But overall, the sum of the first and the second generation species is really quite consistent between the two and still is only a small piece of the pie. So then we can add some things that we can't directly compare between the two. Um, one of those, most importantly, is the products of nighttime chemistry. And this is still a really huge source of uncertainty in this whole uh, picture. In GeoSchem, we have a lumped product from isoprene plus nitrate. And that is being shown to be as important as the other first or second generation species. And it's really difficult to test that with observations because of its lumped nature. In addition, there are some individual species that have been measured that also look important, uh, as important as some of the individual second generation species. And we don't have those explicitly in the model right now. So I think this is one of the region areas that we need to come back to to better understand. Um, if we add up now all of the explicitly measured gas phase species and all of the explicitly modeled gas phase species, we're left with the chunks in gray. And we can explain with the gas phase species less than 50% of the total alkyl nitrates. And the question is where the rest of it is coming from. Um, people might have uh, ideas for the observations, but in the model we can answer that. And in the model that's coming from the aerosol phase. So our isoprene nitrates being partitioned into the aerosol phase. Uh, that's implying that we have more than 50% of the total alkyl nitrates in the aerosol. And there's a question as to whether that number is at all realistic. Um, unfortunately, if we compare to the AMS data from seekers from the Jimenez group, 
the, uh, that implies, we are implying an aerosol, organic nitrate aerosol yield that is much too high. In fact, about a factor of 10 too high. But I will point out that one thing that we haven't got in this simulation yet is that aerosol phase hydrolysis to form nitric acid, which we know to be really important and happen, rap happen rapidly. So that will bring our aerosol nitrate yields down when we get there. I still think that there are probably some uh, big uncertainties in this, and we probably will still have an overestimate. And so our next steps here are to use a bunch of the different SOAS measurements that are out there to try to better constrain and refine this parameterization. Before we do that, there's a question to come back to the NOx budget of how much this process is actually going to matter and how much leverage we're going to get from changing this uh, gas aerosol partitioning of the alkyl nitrates. And to get at that, we've looked at the budget for alkyl nitrates coming out of the model. So even though we're probably grossly overestimating the uptake to the aerosol phase, right now in the simulation, only 10% of the total alkyl nitrate loss of the gas phase species is to this aerosol uptake term, this purple wedge here. And we have much more leverage actually coming from the fast photolysis and from the dry deposition. So to look at how that impacts NOx, we can lump these different loss pathways into those that recycle NOx and we release it to the atmosphere, and that's predominantly photolysis, and those that remove NOx as terminal sinks, and that's primarily deposition. And we find that about 60% of the alkyl nitrates loss results in a NOx terminal sink in the model. That seems like a lot and like it might have a big impact on the NOx budget, but if we look at big aggregated campaign statistics over the whole southeast U.S. region over the whole period, we actually find that of the 50 or so gigagrams of nitrogen emitted per month in this region, only about six of it is lost irreversibly to the AN's formation, which is only about 10 percent. However, this betrays the really high spatial variability in this term. And in fact, if we look at that same metric, which is the fraction of the NOx emitted that is lost via the ANs, at the spatial resolution of the high resolution model, we see a huge range of values here from virtually no impact on the NOx budget from the ANs to in regions where we have very high NOx emissions, very high VOC emissions, and very low NOx emissions like the Ozarks, 70% or more of the NOx being lost via the alkyl nitrates. Now, NOx emissions have already increased a lot across this region, but the RCPs predict that they're going to increase, uh, de sorry, decrease by around 25 to 50% by 2050. So we can expect that as we move into a lower and lower NOx regime in this part of the world, we're going to move into a regime where the alkyl nitrates are increasingly important for the NOx budget and for the organic aerosol budget as well. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. No, that's just in uh, the pie chart on the previous slide. Yeah, no, that's just the loss of the gas phase species. But the aerosol, the aerosol phase is also being deposited. But that's what you do with the aerosol in the bottom? Yeah. It's never converted back, right? It's, it's an irreversible process at the moment. But that's probably something that, I mean, that's where we're hoping that we can use some of the AMS data and some of Joel Thornton's data to make a more realistic uptake term. Sorry, can you repeat the, which term? Uh, the aerosol nitrate in the model is usually already overestimated. You already have too much, so if you're taking more of the source here that would be included if you had a hydrolysis reaction, so that could exacerbate that problem. So, I mean, most of the hydrolysis is going to form nitric acid, which is going to be removed pretty quickly. Um, we tried to look at some of the nitric, uh, sorry, the total nitrate aerosol, but because this term is so high right now, it's not particularly realistic to compare to the total nitrate. There will probably be somewhat of an overestimate in the total nitrate aerosol, but I don't have a good sense of what that number is. 